All right, I have a couple of things to clean up from last time, uh, some overlapping slides, and then we'll carry on in this historical discussion and introduction to modern evolutionary biology, working our way toward the present and our present understanding of organisms and the history of life on Earth. These are the topics I'll be covering today. Um, really focused up through the late 1800s now, up through the Darwinian Revolution, one of these great revolutions in science in terms of our understanding of nature that occurred in the mid-1800s with Darwin's writings and Darwin's discoveries. So we'll be going through that today. Um, from last time, I was asking that we wrestle a bit with this distinction between analogy and homology. You've probably been thinking about this to some degree in the labs and in the course already, and maybe have been introduced to it in the past in biology. It's a fundamental distinction to be made when analyzing organismal characters. And Richard Owen was the guy who originally um, made this distinction between analogy and homology. And he did this in a pre-evolutionary context. You can make this distinction without an evolutionary theory. But it takes on new meaning and is given a new interpretation in an evolutionary context. And that was one of the powerful aspects of Darwinian evolutionary theory. It took old observations and brought them into a new interpretive context. I used the example of my son who had seen a moth fly and assumed it was a bird. <clears throat> when he was three years old. He assumed that this flying thing was a bird because things that fly through the air must be birds. If they have wings, well, it's a bird. Um, no. Um, you have to be a little more sophisticated in your analysis than that. It's not just wings that make a bird. What makes a bird a bird in, in this classical context has much, to do, much more to do with the anatomy of the organism the form of the organism, the morphology. You need a deeper morphological analysis, and today a deeper genetic analysis, to establish relationships and to categorize organisms. You have four flying organisms up here that are not closely related to one another. You have, you have a pterodactyl on top, a, a rept, flying reptile, um, not a dinosaur, but a pterodactyl like this. And there's a model of one, a cast of a fossil specimen up on the third floor of this building. If you haven't seen it, look above T-Rex and you'll see one of these flying around. Well, and then a, a bird related to dinosaurs, a feathered dinosaur, if you want, an insect, and a mammal, all with different basic anatomy underlying these wings that allow them to fly. They may fly for similar reasons, to go seek food, to go seek mates, to escape predators. The reasons for flying could be similar, but the architecture underlying the flying apparatus is vastly different. And Owen knew that. Biologists knew that without an evolutionary concept. That's just an anatomical, a comparative anatomical analysis that can reveal that. These flying structures, given the fact that these organisms aren't related, are analogous. <coughs> These organisms have converged on a similar solution to getting from here to there, to fly, using different means in terms of the underlying morphological apparatus. By contrast, homology, and I probably prefer to dim the lights a bit. Can you see the screen fine back there with this light, or would it be down better down? It's fine. Um, homology, by contrast, for Owen, reflected the fact that these elements of the anatomy related to the same archetype. Now, Owen's working in this platonic context of archetypes. We don't do that anymore. Darwin rewrites the whole interpretive context. But for Owen, the bone in the upper arm in these organisms, very much unrelated, cats, bats, dolphins, and humans, the element in the upper arm, the humerus, is the same bone in all of these unrelated organisms 
for a few basic reasons that I want to establish, because it's in the same position in these different organisms. It's above the two bones in the lower arm, the radius and ulna. It articulates with the rest of the skeleton at the scapula and clavicle, usually. And it's made of the same stuff. So if you dissected it histologically, it has the same composition in terms of the bony architecture of the uh, cellular matrix that the bone is comprised of. And it develops in a similar way embryologically from the, from the fetal organism to the adult. It has a similar developmental pathway. So the relative position, the composition, and the developmental sequence are all similar for this bone that you can call by one name in all these unrelated organisms. The cat has the humerus in the same position, and it's roughly similar. I brought a cat humerus and a human humerus, and you can come compare them and down to the details, and I can show you the details in which these are similar. That's not difficult to see, but a bat, if you look inside a bat's wing, bats fly with their hands. But they do have a little humerus in there. It's mostly hand. You can see the radius and ulna here, the humerus there, and then the big hand that fills out the rest of the wing. Now they've lost a couple of the elements in the hand compared to the cat and compared to the human. But all the elements are in the same position just some of them have been lost, completely lost, and maybe found in the very early development of the organism, or maybe erased completely from the developmental history, not visible to an anatomical analysis. The cetacean, meanwhile, like a dolphin or a whale, the flipper has reproduced the elements, the phalanges in the, in the hand, but hasn't changed the relative position of all the bones. There's the humerus and the radius and the ulna, and the carpal bones of the wrist, they're all in the same position. These are homologous elements of the forelimb, and as opposed to analogous, right? So what do you do? I guess I'm missing a slide there. I was planning an illustrative slide to give you that concept a little further. Um, it may be in your PDF, and if it is, I'd like to ask you to look at it concerning... Um, the quills of porcupines and the spines of hedgehogs and echidnas. I'll come back to it at some point, or you can look at it on your own time. The quills of porcupines and the spines of echidnas and um, hedgehogs, are they homologous or are they analogous? So that's a question we can ask. So in this, building up to Darwin here, we've looked at all this, this history, um, going all the way back to the archaeological record, right? for getting a sense of how humans relate to, the, to nature and to other organisms, and how we develop explanations for the observations on organisms over this vast history, you know, with a, by pick, cherry picking these examples from Chauvet Cave and the Greco-Roman philosophers, forgetting about much of the rest of human history from different parts of the world. So Darwin is steeped in all of that material. He's in a society that's really interested in natural phenomena. At this time, Victorian England, there are people, at least the leisure class, you know, the wealthier folks who have time on their hands, um, are interested in natural phenomena and collecting and just amateur collecting and interest in the natural world. And this painting represents that from that time period with... Uh, these chalky cliffs in the back, you know, showing careful stratification in the geology, people on the coastline collecting shells and curiosities. There's actually a comet blazing through the sky somewhere up in here, if you can see it, representing an actual comet that had um, been registered in years prior to that. So all this awareness and new knowledge about nature congealing in this time period when, when Darwin lived. Darwin famously went on his voyage at age... 22, I believe it was. So right after um, his university studies. He, his intention was to become a medical doctor, which is what the assumption was in his family by his father, that he would become a physician, like his grandfather Erasmus, recall? And either that or he would go into the church. Um, two noble things to do at this time. Darwin didn't, wasn't cut out to be a physician. He was squeamish at the sight of blood. He would 
feel faint. It's not great for a surgeon or anyone to be around that industry if you don't appreciate the sign of blood and you feel faint when you see it. So, and he wasn't particularly good in school. He was a fairly mediocre student. He was more interested in being outside chasing foxes with his dogs or collecting beetles or making observations on plants and geology than he was comfortable in the classroom. So um, feel a kindred spirit there if that registers with you at all. Um, and <coughs> upon graduating from college and having made a transition and a decision to go into theological studies rather than medical studies, he figured he could become a sort of pastor naturalist, someone who was preaching to a congregation, but you only have to do that really once a week. And the rest of the week you could explore the, the countryside, make your collections, make your observations. So he thought he could be like a biologist um, uh, churchman, although the term biologist, uh, yeah, the term biologist was coined by Lamarck in 1800. There wasn't a profession for it yet, though. Um, so he, he gets this offer to go on a ship to survey the coast of South America at age 22. And it, you know, mentions that to his father, and his father says, no way. Um, you're not doing that. That's ludicrous to go two years on a boat um, for no point, really. Um, ultimately, his family was convinced to allow him to do it through the persuasions of other people who did think it was good for him, particularly Darwin was influenced by one of his botanical professors um, at university. He joined this boat, this expedition to map the coastlines of South America for um, mapping purposes to better understand places of trade and um, places that could come to be occupied by, uh, by Britain with a, on a ship that was very well equipped for travel and for scientific study. This guy leading the ship, Captain Fitzroy, was interested in natural study. And he had a big library on the boat as well. He had a library of some 400 volumes in the, in the library. And Darwin's sleeping quarters were actually there, adjacent to the library. The two-year trip turned into a five-year trip, as successful trips, or even sometimes unsuccessful trips often do. They get, end up a lot longer than expected. So essentially for five years, Darwin traveled the world sleeping in a library with these 400 volumes of contemporary works on natural science and exploration, including Humboldt's books um, um, that I believe uh, Henslow had given him, and then um, Lyell's book, Lyell's major work on geology that the Captain Fitzroy had given him. So he had some of these major works at his disposal, and he studied them closely and annotated them. You know, line by line, he was reading them and annotating them. He's also very sick along the way. Darwin was a sickly character, including seasickness. So he suffered hor horribly from seasickness and other ailments then and throughout his life. So he was often confined to bed. But at other times, they'd be at port for, for some period of time while they needed to do their mapping work, and Darwin was free to go roam the landscape and collect collect specimens. He had his gun, he had his equipment to collect and prepare specimens, and he did a lot of that. An example of, I'm going to give you examples from the trip that fed into evolutionary theory, ultimately. Um, armadillos he encountered in South America, a type of creature that only lives in the New World. I say this a lot, right? New World, Old World biologists say that a lot. It's a bit strange, but what I mean by that is the Americas, right, for the New World. Um, and the old world, including Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, armadillos are only in the New World, and they were eating them uh, for dinner in Brazil. And so he came to be familiar with this creature, and he would dissect them. You know, if you're going to eat it for dinner, well, give me the bones and give me the rest, and I'll, you know, prepare it and examine it. And he would also go on walks to fossil sites and collect fossils. And he observed these big creatures, these big lumbering creatures, that he recognized to be closely related to armadillos. Down to the details in the, in the bony scutes that occupy the carapace of the glyptodont, 
just like they do the armadillo. So homologous elements here in the form of these bony scutes to reinforce the similarity between these creatures. These are creatures you don't find in the old world. They're just in South America in this case. And armadillo creeps into North America too a little bit. But it's basically a new world phenomenon. And in his mind, well, we're finding fossils that represent ancient things. We know that because of Steno and Cuvier, that these represent ancient organisms. And we see living organisms that are related to them. But we don't find fossils of these things in Africa. We don't see these things alive today in Africa. They're just in this one place. Why geographically should the fossils be here only where the living things exist? And this is, this is what he'll call his succession of types, his law of succession of types, in the one place finding the ancient forms related to the modern forms. He's sending his fossils to Owen, in fact, back in England. Darwin's not an expert on paleontology, just a young student, right, really? 22, 23 years old. So he's relying on Owen for many of his detailed reconstructions. In the Galapagos, this is where you know you get your most famous tales of Darwin's adventures occur in the Galapagos, and it was very important to him. Most not entirely from the handed down stories, um, which we can clarify a little bit here. But the marine iguanas did influence him. These these creatures on the rocks here, these black forms, right? Um, the Galapagos Islands, these islands off of Ecuador, this archipelago of islands off of Ecuador that are volcanic islands. They're very young volcanic islands. He observed these, these lizards, these iguanas, which he knew from South America, from the rainforests of Brazil, to be tree-dwelling terrestrial lizards. He saw them on the rocks of the Galapagos, foraging in the ocean, swimming in the ocean, eating algae, swimming back to land. A marine lizard, an iguana on the Galapagos that's related to the South American iguanas that doesn't occur anywhere else in the world. Just on these little islands off of South America, you have a strange iguana. You don't have them off on islands off of Africa or islands off of Australia. They're just located geographically next to the iguanas of the world. And a cormorant, similarly, this flightless cormorant. If you are going to watch one Russell Crowe movie, try it, Master and Commander, which does a pretty darn good job with this time period and this, uh, they visit the Galapagos Islands um, in this high plot of high adventure. Um, if you feel like you need a break and watch a movie that actually represents this time fairly well from the natural history side, uh, go for that. Um, the, the cormorant on the Galapagos has these miniature wings, these reduced wings, and can't fly. Cormorant is a bird that lives here in Berkeley. This one on the Galapagos is flightless, and it's related to the ones on the mainland of South America just like your marine iguana was related to South American iguanas. The tortoises that occupied the Galapagos, Darwin kicked himself later because his notes were not particularly good on the tortoises he collected. He heard from the captain of the ship and from the locals in the islands there that every island had a different tortoise. The sh if, you, if you gave one of these local guys a shell of one of these giant tortoises, they could tell you which island it came from. Darwin didn't believe that, essentially. And when he collected his tortoises, he wasn't very careful about indicating which island they came from. They should all just be distributed around the islands. Why should there be a particular kind or species per island? Didn't make any sense to him. There was no reason, no logic for different islands having different species. That was really not a part of his thinking much because of his poor note-taking, but it was important for some of the bird observations he made, not the finches, which is the handed down story that Darwin was so influenced by the discovery of discoveries related to finches. It was more about mockingbirds. So let me tell you about that. Here are the islands, first of all, this complex archipelago of young volcanic islands um, just offshore of Ecuador, far enough to not get too much travel by vertebrates to those islands but close enough that vertebrates can make it to those islands by being um, drifted out, drifting out on rafts of vegetation or flying over or swimming over, however they may get there. When you look at these islands just as a physical phenomenon, you can just see 
this now as a laboratory of evolutionary possibilities because of the relatively large islands separated one from the next, some closer to Ecuador than the others. And the birds, the mockingbirds, have what we would say now differentiated on these islands. Darwin was more careful about his notes on these, and he recognized that different species occupied different islands exclusively without overlapping with one another. One species on this island, one species on this island, one on that, one on, that, on those, and that they were most closely related, these unique birds, to a particular species in Ecuador. All this is, he's mulling all of this over. None of it makes sense to him if he's wrestling with the notion of the origin of species, the question of questions. Where did species come from? Why do species exist in their diversity? That's something that was in the mind of Linnaeus. It was in the mind of Darwin's contemporaries. It's a, it's a problem for this generation. Continuing his travels to places like Australia, where he encounters marsupials, he sees marsupials in Australia that look like familiar placental mammals from England, like moles that he's familiar with from the farmlands in England. Well, he sees marsupial moles in Australia that look like, in basic morphology, gross morphology, look like the placental moles. But you carve them up, and you see that the one has a marsupium, a pouch, that the babies grow up in, and the other has a true placenta and no pouch at all. So you recognize that these things are completely unrelated, not sharing um, homologies that would be important for establish, establishing their relative relationships but similarities functionally. So they're analogous creatures. And these deep convergences between these distant areas are intriguing him and begging explanation, right? He was probably best well trained at this point as a geologist. And on his journey, he's sending papers home, sending information home, including a hypothesis for how coral atolls form. You've, you've seen pictures like this from the Pacific, for example, of these beautiful rings of coral. With the deep blue in the center, per, he was actually, um, some of his ideas on this came from the island of Morea in the South Pacific, where the Integrative Biology Department has a foreign study program in the fall. And so if you, uh, if you get your coursework together, you can apply to go study in Morea in the South Pacific this tropical French paradise in the South Pacific and conduct biological work, really uh, rigorous biological program on these islands, uh, these coral atolls. And it's not too shabby if you uh, get a chance to do that. Try, try for it. Um, an atoll, Darwin recognized, Darwin hypothesized, forms in this ring-type shape by virtue of an eye an island, a volcanic island that once existed, having subsided below the ocean surface. The coral that rings an island that grows just outside of a lagoon around a landmass continues to grow after the heavy island has subsided. So the island having subsided, the coral continues to grow. And what we see today is a chasm with the seamount somewhere below the water surface, and a ring of coral around it in this sort of sequence here. That was a new hypothesis for the formation of a major type of land configuration. That's a huge insight. That's a, one of these great just insights that he gets from his observing series, a series of geological steps in different parts of the Pacific. And he hypothesizes about this, sends the information home, such that by the time he gets home from his trip, he's fa Darwin's famous for his geological work and his adventure. And everyone at home is hungry for this type of vicarious adventure, so they're gobbling it up. And his, uh, his narrative of his voyage became a, became a bestseller. He's also scribbling in his notebooks. He kept these series of notebooks, which um, historians appreciate a lot, because he kept really detailed notes and sequence of his ideas, even though they're sketchy and just sort of uh, chicken scratch. He scratched this little diagram. Um, used to be on B courses for Bio 1B. I don't know if it is this year. Um, this little diagram that has these little branches on it. 
just this simple little diagram in 1837. But if you read his notes, he's starting to speculate on the origin of species with an ancestral form leading on branches, some of which go extinct to living forms, A, B, C, D, these forms that are alive today with these branches with these little lines on them maybe representing extinction, I think, he says. Um, he knows that this is, would be extremely controversial and it stresses him out and the stress causes his hypochondria to kick in and he starts to fall apart. Like, physically, you know, in terms of his, uh, in terms of his well-being. So he's struggling with these notions starting when he gets back home, um, and he'll struggle with them for another 20 years. He gets married and settles down. He marries his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, who is from a very wealthy family, allowing him, he has some wealth in his family already, but he becomes, he marries into extraordinary wealth, which allows him to just work on his ideas, has a garden and a laboratory at home, essentially, and a, a landscape that he can explore. So he's allowed to just basically work on his studies, write, correspond with people all over the world about his investigations. Um, and that wouldn't have been, po you know, that it's societally, that sets him up for this long period of writing that will ensue. In getting married, um, he, he as a careful thinker, establishes the pros and cons of marriage. Um, he writes these in his notebook, you know, pros, children, if it please God, a constant companion and friend in old age, a wife would be, these kinds of things, an object to be beloved and played with, better than a dog, anyhow. <laughs> Man of his times, I guess. A home and someone to take care of house, etc. The uh, cons of marriage, the expense and anxiety of children. I thought that was a pro, having children, but no, it's a con, I guess, as well. Perhaps quarreling, loss of time, cannot read in the evenings, <laughs> fatness and idleness, anxiety and responsibility, less money for books, etc. <laughs> so, um, some insight into his personality, maybe. I don't know. But he, he gets married, he's very happily married, has a uh, bunch of children, one of whom dies at a very young age and has a profound in influence, apparently, according to historians, on his, his relationship to the world, um, challenges him theologically to see his daughter taken away like that. Um, challenging him scientifically was this guy, uh, a great figure in biology, sort of a cult figure um, in biology. Those... Um, a lot of people feel that Wallace was not, is not given the credit he's deserving of in the history of science. How many of you have ever heard of Alfred Russell Wallace? Good number of you, well-educated people that you are, but everyone's heard of Darwin, right? So Darwin um, became the one to be famous for his ideas on evolution, and deservedly so. He wrote more about it. He wrote it in much more sophisticated detail. Wallace always graciously said Darwin deserves the credit here. But Wallace sent a letter outlining his evolutionary hypothesis to Darwin. Wallace sent this from Indonesia when he was working there. Wallace was a great collector from a lower class of Darwin in this highly stratified Victorian England, right? He, Wallace is out there collecting to be paid. He's collecting specimens and sending them home and being paid for it. That's how he's financing his trips. He sends a letter home to Darwin outlining outlining a, an evolutionary hypothesis. And it looks more or less exactly to Darwin like Darwin's own hypothesis. And it scares Darwin because he's about to get scooped by this guy Wallace who's ha in a malarial fit in Indonesia. And Darwin r gets the letter. He doesn't rip it up and trash it. Instead, he takes the letter to his colleagues who are well-positioned in uh, British scientific society, and they, these letters, Wallace's and a outline of Darwin's ideas are read at a meeting of scientists in London together. So simultaneously, both ideas are read and they're remarkably convergent. Wallace's ideas are 
almost identical to Darwin's ideas in their basic structure. Why might that be? Why might, how could you explain that convergence? At least one reason for Wallace's idea and Darwin's idea on a common hypothesis of evolution. Because he may have made similar observations on islands that were separate, like the Galapagos. He did. He did, in fact. He's in an archipelago that's equally rich, more rich than the Galapagos. So he makes similar observations during his journeys. And Wallace had worked in the Amazon for many years before that. What else? Down to the details, the similarities in some of their ideas. One other idea, maybe? Somebody's got an idea, I know it. The one I'm thinking of is that they're reading similar material. There's a similar intellectual context, what the historians call an intellectual milieu, right? They're reading the same books, they're steeped in the same ideas, and that's influencing the way they portray their hypotheses. They've both just read Malthus. And this, is a, this is an important one. Thomas Malthus's essay on the principle of population. Malthus, um, I'm sure you've heard of him at some point, right? Let's see if I can get this to work. Malthus outlined something about uh, British society that he observed. He observed that the resources available to people were increasing arithmetically, right? Additive growth. Additive growth or arithmetic growth, the resources available to people in this society. Sorry, the, uh, yes, the resources available to people in terms of food, in terms of access to um, um, shelter, homes, the number of places to live. But the population of the society was increasing multiplicatively or exponentially. So multiplicative growth, right? Multiplicative growth. And this disconnect between the rate at which people were increasing in numbers and the resources available to people would create a serious gap, a serious problem down the road. So Malthus was predicting feasts, was predicting great famine and misery on the part of society in the future. That's a social argument, um, but Wallace and Darwin read that and recognized the connection to the natural world and to other organisms, which grow similarly, which have that exponential power of growth as well, and whose resources don't increase at a comparable rate. So they saw in nature what Malthus was seeing in human society. Darwin and Wallace were struck, as everyone is who looks at organisms, about organismal fecundity, the ability of organisms to reproduce with such great um, numbers. Here's a giant clam um, producing uh, gametes there on a, on a reef, or a sunflower here with all of its seeds. This great overproduction of offspring that occurs by organisms not all of which will be able to survive because resources are not sufficient. And not only that, Darwin and Wallace for the first time take seriously the fact that these individuals that are produced vary in their characters. They vary in their traits. They differ one from the next. No two snowflakes are alike. Okay, well, no two organisms are alike either. So they're overproduced, organisms are highly fecund, and the offspring that they produce vary in their traits and characters. Some of that variation on the part of these individuals is heritable. Everyone knows that from their lives in general, that the offspring of two parents tend to resemble the parents. There's heritability in the variation that's observed. All these, these key parts enter the framework for both Darwin and Wallace. 
And in the context of human agriculture or animal husbandry, something very familiar to the people of Victorian England, they're all, it's a farming culture, that when you selectively choose the variations that you appreciate and allow those preferred variants to reproduce, you end up steering your population toward a type that you find desirable, maybe that produces more milk or that has the best feathers um, or whatever it may be, or the dog that um, can climb down the uh, foxhole the best or runs the fastest, that the favored traits are preserved in the course of artificial selection in this human context, Darwin and Wallace are going to make the leap to nature, natural selection, analogous to artificial, <coughs> artificial selection. So in this two-step thinking of Darwin and Wallace, the surplus production, the fecundity of heritable variation is followed by a sorting of that variation by this phenomenon that they call selection that will be called natural selection. And that works whether you're talking about artificial selection of, of dogs and cows and pigeons, or whether you're talking about the natural selection of butterflies in Indonesia or iguanas in South America. So they make that leap easily between um, the human context and the natural context. Let's contrast it with the prior evolutionary mechanism of Lamarck. Now, Lam giraffes are always linked to Lamarck. Lamarck didn't have really anything at all to say about giraffes, but somehow he gets linked to giraffes, and we'll, we'll uh, continue the um, funny historical bit on that. Um, Lamarck did argue that organisms were influenced by their needs, this French word, besoin, which was really important, B E S. O I N S, if you can read that. Besoin. It's a French word, right? It just means needs. So that's strange to Darwin and the British because you have these needs of the organism, these psychological needs that are influencing the organism to do something that ultimately impact their evolution. The British and Darwin, they want a con more concrete mechanism, a more physical mechanism than the needs of the giraffe, like hunger, driving it to reach higher and higher and thereby stretch its neck, literally extend its neck to reach those higher and higher foods and thereby develop a longer neck during life that will be passed on to their offspring because of that heritability of the variation that's produced. That's the Lamarckian process that would create change in the individual organism that would be passed down to its offspring because of the purported heritability of these changes. By contrast, the Darwinian and Wallachian me mechanism is one at a population level where you have variants in the population that differ, and some of them are more successful than the others, leading to greater reproductive output and greater reproductive success on the part of the variants, for example, the tall variants not because they stretched their neck during their lives to become tall and somehow passed that on to their offspring, but because the tall ones in the population during a time when food was short were the ones that were able to survive and or the ones that were able to produce more offspring that were more fecund than the other individuals, leading to another generation of taller giraffes. It's a fine contrast. It works fine enough to contrast uh, Lamarck and Darwin this way with the giraffes, um, but it, you just recognize it's highly simplified. Another really important thing to recognize is that this phenomenon of inheritance of acquired characteristics was completely understood to be valid by Darwin also. The inheritance of acquired characteristics is not Lamarck's um, argument alone. Everyone in the 1800s thought that if you stretched your neck during your life, your offspring would have a neck that was a bit longer than your neighbors. If you went, yeah, um, I'll reinforce that point later probably because that's, that's one of these gross uh, errors of the textbook to link that only to Lamarck. Yes, please. 
Yes, yeah, so the whole phenomenon of epigenetic research and understanding, that's very much 21st century or late 20th century, right? So um, they don't know anything about that. They don't know anything about genes, which is one of the main points I'm going to get to here. But you can link some of the results from epigenesis back to traditional Lamarckian notions if you want. Certainly Lamarck wasn't thinking about the molecular basis of any of, um, any of these phenomena. The general evolutionary theory of Darwin's had some of these Huttonian characteristics with it. Remember the, um, the ideas of Hutton, of gradualism? Well, there, Darwin adheres to most of that type of framework. Slow, gradual changes that happen in a very continuous way. So changes over these vast periods of time occurring slowly and gradually. There's some argument about that, exactly what's meant by gradual, whether Darwin would allow for big leaps of change or not. Historians, to some degree, disagree. But the phrase that Darwin returns to again and again is change by insensible degrees. And by that he means like you can't perceive these small changes easily. They're so small over time, these changes in, in the evolutionary process in the, in the organisms observed. What does Darwin's um, evolutionary theory help to explain? It explains the unity we see in the diversity of organisms. Here's a diverse group of carnivorous mammals, um, including everything from cats to mongooses to skunks and hyenas and dogs and bears and raccoons, oh my. All these things are diverse, look all completely different, eat different things, but they are unitary in sharing a common genetics that's similar to one another and details of their bones and teeth and physiology that links them all into a single group. So they have this great diversity, but all tied with a certain unity back to a common ancestor, as Darwin would say. So the homologous elements in here are explained by Darwin, not with reference to archetypes, not with reference to platonic ideals, but with reference to common ancestry. Humans and cats and bats and whales all share a homologous humerus because their ancestor, their common ancestor, had this bone in this position. They're homologous because their ancestor, their common ancestor, had it. It's a new explanation a new historical explanation for homology. And Owen couldn't stand it. Owen was still alive. Owen ended up outliving Darwin. He was born before Darwin, I believe, and he outlived Darwin. And Owen was living in London while Darwin was writing this stuff, and it's a famous battle. This guy who used to help Darwin with his fossils, now they're at odds um, and really working against each other because Owen wasn't having this. Here's the slide I thought was earlier on... Uh, homology and analogy. So I'll ask you to wrestle with this. Um, it's, it's not simple. It's, it's, it'll require a little bit of uh, effort on your part to, to get this, I think. The quills of porcupines. And there are two types of porcupines. There are new world, new world porcupines and old world porcupines. And they're not closely related to each other. They're both rodents. They're both really big rodents, yeah. But they're not that closely related within rodents. But they both have quills. Echidnas, these things are monotremes related to platypuses, totally different from these things. And hedgehogs, they're different again. They're related to shrews and moles. None of these things are very closely related, but they all have this exterior quilly spiny coat. Why do they have a quilly spiny exterior? To, prevent, to keep from being eaten, right? They have a common analogous reason for having this form. So it's an analogy, right? It's an analogous mechanism for defending against predators. But what happens when you get into the histology and the details? You look at the quills and spines here in detail, and you find that they're similarly structured. They're both in this, they both have this muscular connection to a, a similar type of muscle. 
They both grow out of a little follicle that gets greased along the way as it grows by the sebaceous glands. They have a common histology. They're, both, they're all derived from hair. And at that level, they're homologous. So you can look at the same phenomenon at different levels. Has a whole coat against predators? Analogous. In detail, in terms of histological structure and development and position? As homologous. I don't know if I said analogous the first time I mentioned it. Yes, please. And serve a similar function. Yes, exactly. So what you said was, they're, you said, wait. So they're all homologous structures because they develop similarly and they're all derived from hair. And they're analogous structures because they evolved independently, and I added, and serve a similar function. Yes, exactly. So they're simultaneously homologous and analogous depending on your perspective and the level on which you examine this. That's what you have to wrestle with a bit. That'll become um, a big part of your lab understanding um, as we move forward. So some examples of convergence. Uh, on this campus, you can see two birds like this if you look carefully around. Swallows and swifts. They look alike, but they're not related. They're all, they're all birds, of course, but not closely related. Pigeons and auks, similar thing. Diving birds, heavy-bodied, flightless, catching fish underwater, similar in shape and strategy, but unrelated genetically, evolutionarily. Or even deeper connections in the fusiform body shape of the penguin with sharks and ichthyosaurs and these mammalian dolphins. Similar fusiform shapes for getting through the water rapidly in pursuit of fish, but very much unrelated. They're convergences. And Darwinian evolutionary theory can explain this in new ways than anything could prior to that. Some of the great science of this period was coming out of embryology, studies of the early development, the earliest development of the fetus. And there was a recognition that early in fetal development, organisms as dissimilar as birds and humans shared traits <coughs> in early, the early developmental <coughs> sequence. Darwin could explain this observation of embryology based on common ancestry. And the loss of these traits, for example, these pharyngeal pouches that are related to the production of gills in fish, the loss of these traits later in adulthood as a deviation, as a derivation away from a common ancestral foundation. An easy one to explain in this context and that the public could understand quickly, because a lot of the public was reading this with interest, were vestigial structures. For example, the fact that cetaceans like dolphins have little bones. There's a baby, baby dolphin and old, somewhat older stages. But these little shadows here represent the hips and the hind limbs that exist in the body of the whale, not attached any longer to the skeleton, just floating bony bits. The vestige of the hips and legs that existed in the ancestral types. How do you explain these little bony bit vestiges in a whale except by an ancestor that once had hips and legs? Why in the world would they be there if not for having a common ancestor, a shared ancestry? Darwinian theory could explain the fossil record and there were a lot of difficulties also with Darwinian theory. We'll pick up with the dark difficulties and get into molecular biology on Monday. Best wishes for your exam tonight. <laughs>